Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of Bird's Eye View, where we connect the past to the present in order to understand what makes the Black community unique. I am your host, Trina Bird of Bird Owl Consulting, and I know I've been kind of out um, lately, but last Monday I was actually presenting at a conference. I presented at the Small Museum Association Conference, and it was also my birthday. So Monday last week was kind of a, a really busy day, but for this episode, I actually recorded the presentation that I presented at the conference, so I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to hear the presentation. So basically, my presentation was about women's suffrage because this is the 100 years since the women's suffrage movement happened and the 19th amendment happened which um if you don't know that was the amendment that gave the right for women to vote however my presentation looks at what the women's suffrage movement meant to african-american women because suffrage for us was totally different than for our white counterparts and people can make the argument that our suffrage our right our fight for the right to vote did not even end until until 1965 with the voting rights act of 1965 but you can also take it even further to the present of today we are still having to fight for the right and to making sure that we get the right to vote and and not where they are thinking of different ways to disenfranchise um black women or people of color in in voting so we all know that this year is also a big election year with the presidential vote so i want you guys to take a listen to my presentation and let me know what you think but before we get to that i really let's do a break right quick and then we can get into the presentation Hi guys, so if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. For one, it's free. There's creation tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your computer or from your phone. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast as well, so you don't have to have a lot of listeners in order to make money. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So be sure to download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Now back to our show. So good morning. morning. So just to let everybody know, this is women's suffrage, 400 years in the making from slavery to the present. In the right place? Cool beans, cool beans. So let's go ahead and get started. So the word slavery. What do you think about when you hear the word slavery? Suffrage, okay. Anything else? Black people. Black people, okay. Chains. Chains, okay. Anything else? Suffering. Suffering. Forced labor. Forced labor, okay. How does these words make you feel? How does the word slavery make you feel? When you feel? Depressed. Depressed. Angry. Angry, okay, as it, as it should. And why do you think you feel this way when you hear that word? Unjust. Unjustice, okay. Anything else? <coughs> okay, so. Because impacts are still happening today. Exactly. And there's different kinds of slavery, but there's also some kinds that are still happening today. Exactly. So if you know from the past, why is it still? <laughs> that, is, that is a very, very good question. <laughs> that, is a, that is a very good question. I ask myself that all the time. Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll kind of dive into why I asked you those questions. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Trenda Bird. I've been working in museums for about eight years. I am originally from Hickory, North Carolina. So if you hear my Southern accent, that is why sometimes it, it comes out. Um, I actually have two undergraduate degrees. I have a history in, B, I have a, a BA in history with a concentration in US history and a minor in black studies. And then I also have a bachelor of science degree in applied history with a concentration in public history. So I did both of those degrees at a school named Appalachian State University, which is in Boone, North Carolina. So right in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, I moved up here to Maryland 
in 2012 where I received my master's in museum studies and historical preservation. And currently I am also the assistant director at the College Park Aviation Museum. But I'm also the founder, <laughs> the founder and CEO of Bird Owl Consulting. And I'm also, I also host a podcast called Bird's Eye View, which is part of my consulting business. And so the podcast actually looks at what is happening in black America today through the eyes of history. And through the raw and authentic conversations, I try to cover various topics that cover black identity, black culture, and race relations. And from time to time, I actually have guest speakers on. What is Bird Owl Consulting? Why did I create this, this business? Well, first of all, my services provides, um, I provide services to school district, uh, school administra administrators, teachers, museums, and various organizations around the United States on the importance and on um, African American history and how to teach effectively on that subject. Because from what I have seen, I'm probably, you guys have seen whether on social media, whether on news, you hear about a teacher that may be assigned a homework assignment that ended up being a little bit offensive for some people. And it's not that she or he is, they weren't thinking about the implications of what that homework assignment might have been. Or they don't really have the tools or the resources to give out some of these homework assignments or to teach or they're not able to articulate in a way that will get the information across to their students. I also had started this business because from my time working at Historic Brattonsville as a historic interpreter, we would sometimes have schools that would come to our site. And when I would ask a certain question, some of the kids would answer and they were giving me answers that was not either wasn't appropriate or it was just flat out false information. And when I would dig into, when I dig a little deeper, I would find out that it's, it was the teacher that was teaching these things. And so it, kind of, it was very disheartening because this information is very important information because we already have such a hard time teaching African American history, talking about slavery and the injustice that, that occurred here in this country. So we don't need to add to by having false information or just coming up with all kinds of stories and trying to offend people. So that's part of the reason why I created this this business as well. And so again, the mission is to encourage people to have meaningful and truthful conversations about African American history that will ultimately empower one another. So today's presentation is going to be a course about women's suffrage, 400 years in the making from slavery to the present. And the purpose of this presentation is that I'm going to address the impact or the impacts that the women's suffrage movement had on the lives of black American women and how it differed from our white counterparts. We're going to be discussing several aspects of how the women's suffrage movement uh, for, black American, for black American women actually began in 1619 with enslavement, going through 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And the goal of this session is not only for you to, um, to get this information, but I also want you to walk away with different tools and practical ways that you can add women's suffrage into your programming. So just because you're at a historical site and you're talking about slavery, you can also, um, when it comes, what comes to mind when you think about white women and suffrage? Susan B. Anthony. Okay, Susan Mary B. Anthony. Poppins. You said, you said what? <laughs> Mary, Mary Poppins. Poppins. Okay. What else? Privileged. Privileged. That is a great word. Anything else? Exclusionary, right. What about when you think of black women in suffrage? Ida B. Wells. Okay. Intersectionality. Okay. Not enough information. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's all the That's exactly right. Because, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you one thing. When I was actually putting this presentation together, I had Googled, um, I was looking for some, for some images, and I Googled, women's suffrage movement, and I hit, clicked on images. Every single image was of white women. I had to go back and type in women's suffrage, black women, and then the picture started picking up. That is white privilege, because that is because what we're so used to seeing when we're thinking about white privilege 
our mind goes directly to that. So I thought that was very interesting as I was putting this presentation together because I was like, huh, like I'm having to type in more words just to find what I'm looking for. So, so that, that is exactly right. So let's look at the word itself, suffrage. Um, I think it's an interesting word because suffrage, suffer, when <laughs> it's, it's kind of an interesting word, but it's, it's a noun. And it literally means the right to vote in political elections, okay? And it comes from the Latin word, let's see if I can say this right, the Latin word is suffragium, which initially meant a voting tablet, a ballot, the right to vote. And it's actually the second, in, in the second century, it later became to mean political patronage, influence, interest, support, and sometimes popular claim and applause. So when we're talking about the word suffrage, that's basically what that means. But what we're doing here is we're kind of stretching the meaning of that. So again, when I, again for black women at least, here in America, suffrage started with the enslavement. Because when you think about it, if when they first brought the Africans over here to be enslaved as, as a person, enslaved people were not seen as people, right? They were seen as property, they were, were, they were chattel. So in order to even have the right to vote, you first have to be seen as a person. You have to be seen as someone who even has rights. So if you don't even have that right of being a human being, how can you have the right to vote? So that is where the whole conversation of suffrage come in when you're talking about enslavement and talking about um, black, black women. Um, so we're just coming off the cusp of 400 years of the anniversary of when the first Africans were brought here. Um, the Africans were actually stolen from what I call the motherland, the continent of Africa. Historians actually believe that it was an estimated six to seven million Africans that were brought or imported to the New World during, during the 19th century alone. Okay, just the 19th century. <coughs> Looking at black women in slavery, some of the roles in the culture of, of, being, um, of being a black woman. So they were cooks, that was, a very, that was considered a skilled labor. They were nannies, they were also wet nurses, they also plowed the fields, they took care of the animals, basically doing a lot of the same jobs that a lot of men were doing, okay? Um, if you were a cook, then you were seen as kind of like the top, the top person um, because that cooking was a skill that you had to really, really hone, okay? You had to memorize the recipes, you had to know what kind of measurements you needed. Because back then, it, it didn't say in the, in the recipe books or the receipt books, it doesn't say a cup of milk. It just says pour some milk. So you had to have that talent in order to know, like measure out, like how much do I put in here, memorizing those recipes. As nannies, of course, they were in, that was a domesticated, a, a domesticated job. And then as wet nurses, as um, women who had just had babies, they were lactating, so they were actually serve as wet nurses to the mistresses. Of course, again, they were seen as property, um, seen as vessels for creating more money. So what do you think I mean when I say creating more money? Children. 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 So you wanted, they wanted you to bear children, okay? And I find it interesting that for a lot of these black women, if you were able to bear children, if you were fertile, that means that you were actually worth a lot more money. You were, a, you were a hot commodity because, of course, the more children you could get, the more money you could make, the more profit you can make. Because remember, back during this time, slavery was a way of life. It was the economy. It was a business. Okay? So let's look at white women in slavery. Oftentimes in schools, we are taught or assume that most slave owners were the white men, right? When the fact was 40% of slave owners were actually white Southern women, okay? According to the 1850 and 1860 census. Now, for example, George Washington, our first president, had about 18 enslaved people in 1759. His wife, Martha, 
increased the enslaved population to about 84, which at that time made her the richest, um, made, her, made, her, made her the richest woman in Virginia at that time, okay? Now, that was kind of unheard of in terms of having that many enslaved people as a woman, but it wasn't, it didn't erase the fact that she, that women had enslaved, enslaved people. And so when you look at the hierarchy, white women were still above even the black woman, okay? A lot of times, sometimes people try to put us side by side, but the reality was that we were still below even the white woman, okay? Back then, if your parents were slaveholding parents, a lot of times they would actually give their daughters more enslaved people and more um, in more land, okay? Because the more enslaved people you have, the more land that you can get, the better chances of you getting married. So white Southern women, their identities was tied to owning other people. And therefore, also their identity was tied to, the goal of marriage was tied to owning enslaved people. So that is why you have this, this thing where that notion that white women, they were owning a lot of enslaved people because that was the goal. And the goal was marriage back then. If you were a white Southern woman, you, you wanted to get married. Um, and a lot of this information, there's a book that I found that I got some of this information from, um, from a history professor from the University of California, Berkeley. Her name is Stephanie Jones Rogers. And she actually wrote a book um, called they were, they were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South. So if you want to get more information about just how um, inclusive this was, I suggest that you, you take a look, look at that. Um, there are some things that I found in, that were that were very interesting to read. A lot of times when you hear about black women that were sexually assaulted and having, and having producing more kids, there are some claims that, that, the, that the mistresses were actually orchestrating these sexual assaults so that way they were correlating with their pregnancies so that, would, that, that way they would have um, the wet nurses that they needed to be able to feed their children. Um, so I thought, I thought that was appalling when I, when I heard that. It doesn't surprise me, but it's, it's also appalling that that's just how these women were, were used. So let's, let's split up suffrage and look at suffrage in the eyes of white women. So suffrage movement, it actually began decades before the Civil War. So we're not just talking about 1920. We're talking about how this was decades in the making. Um, so... Bef prior to this, a lot of times in 1820s, 1830s, a lot of the land and the property were given to white men. And the women, they say, hey, we want to be able to have land and we want to be able to have property as well. So hence the fight for suffrage. Um, so 1820s, 1830s, there were a lot of reform groups that came about. So you have religious movements, you have moral reform societies, anti-slavery organizations, and women were part of this. So not to leave out, as women, we were in this fight, both black and white. But it just looked, it looked different for each group. Many women at the time were starting to rethink the idea that they were supposed to be pious and submissive and being that, you know, the home, the homebody, um, and rethinking what it meant to be an American citizen in the United States. So now you have the Seneca Fall Convention. Um, 1848, a group of ab abolitionist activists, mostly women, but you did have some men that were included in there, that went to Seneca Fall, New York, to discuss the problem of women's rights. And some of, some of the reformers, like you mentioned, Elizabeth Stanton and Lucretia uh, Mott, and at the convention, that's where they all agreed, hey, women should have the ability to own uh, political identities and have a voice, which we all should. So when it came to the Civil War, the suffrage movement kind of lost momentum a little bit. So when the 14th and 15th Amendment came around, it rose those familiar questions of suffrage and citizenship. Okay, 
So now that you have the 14th and 15th Amendment, the women are like, wait a minute, this is a good time to start, you know, bringing this up again and start fighting again. So the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, which extends the Constitution's protections to all citizens. But let's be clear, all citizens included white male. So that's a lot of other people left out, right? <laughs> Um, the 15th ratified in 1870, which guaranteed black men the right to vote. So now you have 13th, 14th, 15th. 13th did what? Abolish slavery. Abolish slavery. The 14th did what? The citizenship. Yeah, white men. But then the 15th did what? The right. Yeah, so basically... 15th was the right to vote, but now you include black and white men, okay? So still, that leaves out the white women and the black women. So women's suffrage advocates like Stanton and Anthony believe that this would be their chance to push lawmakers for truly universal suffrage. As a result, they actually refused to support the 15th Amendment and even allied with racist Southerners who argue that white women's votes could be used to neutralize those cast by African Americans. So that's how much they wanted to have the right to vote, okay? Now you have within the suffrage, you have, of course, these different associations. You have the National Woman so uh, Suffrage Association, which was founded by Lucy Stone in 1869. Um, which this association fought for a universal suffrage amendment to the U U.S. Constitution. And this association, they argued that it, it was unfair to endanger black in, in enfranchisement by tying it to, <clears throat> excuse me, the Mark, Martin E. Less popular campaign for female suffrage. Another association, of course, that was part of the suffrage movement was the American Woman Suffrage Association, which was pro-15th Amendment, which also included men. And then, so those are kind of the associations. So then, finally, August 18th, 1920, you have the 19th Amendment that was ratified, and then on November 2nd of that same year, more than 8 million women across the United States voted in elections for the first time. So, hey. Big win, okay? That was a huge win. Now, which? 100 years ago. So let's look at suffrage in the eyes of the black woman, okay? What did women suffrage look like for black women? Well, for black women, women's suffrage was more than just voting for them. They were fighting for the right to be heard, just as human beings. They wanted to have a voice and to be seen as equal to white men, white women, and even black men, okay? And so for black women, they were in two worlds. You had the world of being black and the world of being a woman. And I always um, have this little thing that I say to some of my friends that I am a left-handed black woman. So that's like three strikes against me, okay? <laughs> Um, but all in all, proud of all three. <laughs> um, so black men and so black men and white women actually dominated the suffrage movement and were often excluded from their activities and organizations. Okay, through black women, they are less well remembered, but they played an important role in getting the 15th and 19th amendments passed. Black men wanted their support in fighting racial discrimination and prejudice, while white women wanted them to help change the inferior status of women in American society. Both groups ignored the unique challenges that black women had to face. So everybody was like, hey, we want you to help us over here, but we want you to help us over here, but what about us? Okay, we're, we're trying to get the equal playing field here. So some of the well-known black reformers of our time, people like Mary Church Terrell, who was a well-known um, African-American activist who championed racial equality and women's suffrage in the late 
uh, 19th century and early 20th century. And I believe that is her at the top right corner right there. She also helped founded the National Association of Colored Women. And that was another, that was a suffrage group. So my question is, when they were forming these associations, why do you think they were forming these associations? Because they weren't welcome into the white. They weren't, yeah, right. They weren't welcome into the white women association. And that was always interesting to me because now you have a group who were already discriminated against, discriminated against another group. So it's like, wait a minute, do you not remember why you're fighting in the first place? So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of that, that thinking that it doesn't matter that we're always willing, we're not really thinking sometimes that how we are discriminating against other people or being prejudiced or having other preferences. So gotta, gotta keep that in mind. You also have Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who was a poet, fiction writer, journalist, and activist. Um, she also helped um, enslaved people escape through the Underground Railroad and wrote frequently for the anti-slavery newspapers in earning her reputation as the mother of African-American journalism. You also have Harriet Tubman. Everybody knows who Harriet Tubman is. She, she is my girl. Um, <laughs> she, is, she was a um, abolitionist. She helped free hundreds of people through the Underground Railroad. She was an activist. She was just everything, just the awesome woman that she was, okay? And we also have Sojourner Truth, who was probably the most, when you think of black women's suffrage, like we said, you think of Sojourner Truth, because she was a true activist. She was an um, abolitionist. She, she is probably well, she's well known for her speech, Ain't I a Woman? So that is one of my favorite speeches that she has ever done. Then you also have Nanny Helen Burroughs. She was an educator and activist. She actually opened the National Training School for Women and Girls. And then you have Ida B. Wells, investigative journalist, educator, and early leader in the civil rights movement. So all of these women, they were fighters. They were people that believed in the rights of not only being a woman, but also just being a black person. And so those are just some of the few that I like I said, black women tended to focus on human rights and universal su suffrage rather than suffrage solely for African Americans or for women. So they wanted to make sure that everyone had the right to vote. Many black suffragists weighed in on the debate over the 15th Amendment, which would enfranchise black men, um, but not black women. So Journal Truth argued that black women would continue to face discrimination and prejudice unless their voices were uplifted by those of black men. So we had to get our brothers to say, hey, you need to help us in, in doing this, okay? Um, so now you have, of course, the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896. And they actually had a motto of lifting as we climb, because the goal was to uplift the status of black women. Uh, there was another club called the Alpha, the Alpha Suffrage Club of Chicago, which was founded in 1913 by Ida B. Wells. And it was the nation's first black women's club focused specifically on suffrage. And so this is some of the girls from that group. So after the 19th Amendment was ratified, black women voted in elections and held offices. However, many states passed laws that discriminated against black Americans and limited their freedoms. Black women continued to fight for their rights. You have people like Mary Cloud Bethune, who was an educator and a political advisor, and she actually formed what was called the National Council of Negro Women in 1935 to, to pursue civil rights. And the fight continued for black women until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed. So from, 19, from 1920 to 1965, that's what, like, what, 40-something? Yeah. So. Okay, so that was just part one of my presentation. Uh, because my presentation was, like, 45 minutes, I didn't want to 
have it too long on the podcast. So that was just kind of the first part of my my presentation. Um, part two, I'm going to post immediately after this along with part one so you guys can listen to both of them. So be sure to check out my website and check out um, me on social media. You can follow me and see what else I have coming up. Um, I'm going to continue to write on my blog and I will see you guys next time. Bye.